The Platinum Chip is one of the most important items in the Fallout universe, and one of the main points of contest in Fallout New Vegas. The Platinum Chip has the ability to sway the fate of Vegas to whomever possesses it, granted they also control the Securitrons that the chip would upgrade. The chip would also upgrade the systems of the Lucky 38, which would upgrade the anti-missile defenses of the Lucky 38, which would only be useful during the Great War. Most people should be familiar with the story of this chip. Robert House, the CEO of Robco in the year 2077, was aware of the inevitability of nuclear war, and he intended to protect Vegas from it, then subsequently rule it. Unfortunately, the Platinum Chip which he needed to carry this out was a day from delivery when the Great War occurred. House's defenses still managed to stop 68 of the 77 warheads that targeted the region, but the strain on the system was too much. He had to deal with system crashes and power outages for the next 5 years. Then he went into a coma in his life preservation chamber for the next 6 decades. He would eventually organize the tribes of the broken city of Vegas to rebuild it, and strike a deal with the new California Republic to repair Hoover Dam and supply Vegas with power. That basically brings us to where we start off in Fallout New Vegas. So now we ask the question, what if Mr. House received the Platinum Chip on time? This alternate timeline I think has the greatest capacity for change in the Fallout series, but the funny thing is, the divergence in the timeline can be one of the smallest possible. It could be as simple as House ordered the chip a day earlier, or perhaps he had an Amazon Prime subscription and got the same day delivery. House only needs the chip one day earlier. So let's start off. If it's October 22nd, the Platinum chip is successfully delivered to the Lucky 38. Mr. House uses it to upgrade his systems. Then he sends it off to the Securitron Vault to be loaded into the system there. By the night of October 22nd, the Platinum Chip is inserted into the Securitron Vault and the Securitron Army is ready to be deployed on Mr. House's command. So Mr. House continues preparing for the destruction of the world, unaware of its imminence. The following day, October 23rd, 2077, the entire world launches its nuclear arsenal, destroying every nation in the process. 77 warheads target Vegas and the surrounding area. Without the Platinum Chip, Mr. House would only be able to stop 68 of the warheads, but with the Platinum Chip and all the upgrades along with it in the Lucky 38, all 77 warheads are disarmed or destroyed by the Lucky 38, protecting Vegas and the surrounding area from Nellis to Cottonwood. With the rest of the country in ruin and the capital destroyed, things turn to chaos. The governor and the military search for any trace of the government through radio, however none can be found, and most of the airwaves are taken up by people desperately calling for help. It appears the governor of Nevada is now the highest member of government left. The governor immediately enacts martial law in the region and deploys the National Guard. The Adjutant General of Nevada, General Thorne, mobilizes the active military as well. After the military is deployed throughout the area, all crime is treated with lethal force, bringing order back temporarily. Vegas is able to continue to operate, being self-sufficient in all basic needs, like power, water, and food. Hearing of the safety in Lower Nevada, refugees start pouring in from the decimated cities outside of the region. Relief efforts are undertaken and temporary housing is set up for the refugees. The already overwhelmed police force and military is spread even thinner protecting the refugees and trying to maintain order. The situation dwells further when raider gangs start to enter the region. The military is quickly overwhelmed and they soon begin losing men to desertion, rioting, and bandit attacks. Colonel Blackwell at Nellis Air Force Base demands that he be allowed to commence bombing raids on the bandits, but the governor, supported by Thorne, denies the request and considers it a waste of resources. General Thorne continues to search for military or government transmissions. Most frequencies are now silent though. He eventually does find that Fort Irwin is still standing, but they are caught up in the same problems Vegas is experiencing and would be unable to assist. By December, the number of raiders entering the region are the same as the refugees, with military survivors few and far between. Simultaneously, the situation in Vegas is worsening as crime increases with the military overextending. Taking severe action, the governor orders all military personnel back to Vegas and Hoover Dam. Blackwell is ordered to stop all relief efforts and ground all wings, and most of his forces are diverted from Nellis to Vegas. All of this only works to worsen the situation, as there's no longer anyone protecting the outer communities that plunged into chaos by the raiders, and yet more territory is lost to them. The only saving grace is that the raider gangs are fighting amongst themselves. This is the perfect opportunity for Mr. House to make his move. Contacting Colonel Blackwell, Mr. House offers a solution to the current problem. On the condition that Blackwell pledges to aid him in the event of a resistance, Mr. House will solve the problem with his Securitrons and aid Blackwell with all the resources he needs when House installs himself as the administrator of Vegas. 
Blackwell begrudgingly accepts after a demonstration of the Securitron's full potential and the promise of hundreds of them. As Vegas spirals further and further into anarchy from gang crime and the military uses harsher tactics to eliminate threats with little care for collateral damage, the public calls for the governor's head. The situation is perfect for Mr. House. He begins his takeover of Vegas by flooding the streets with Securitrons. Assuring that they are here to help, the Securitrons begin taking down the gangs one by one. Eventually, along with Blackwell and his men, they move to the governor's office and disperse the crowds of protesters. Mr. House demands that the governor step down and hand the city over to him. General Thorne threatens Mr. House, then House informs him of Blackwell's support in favour of new management. The governor agrees to step down, but Thorne calls on his soldiers to target the Securitrons. However, they choose to side with Blackwell and his giant kill robots. Thorne is subsequently relieved of his position and arrested, leaving Mr. House in control of Vegas and Blackwell as the highest ranking military officer in the region and potentially this side of the country. House immediately begins reorganizing Vegas. The Securitrons become the backbone of law and order and emerge into the police force. All police officers are assigned a Securitron partner and mass production of the riot gear is commenced, with the intent of it becoming the standard uniform for the Vegas police force. Nearly the entirety of the construction industry in Vegas is tasked with building new districts to accommodate the mass increase in population from refugees. The first step is building a new robotics factory capable of constructing Securitrons and construction bots. By January, the police force is sufficiently equipped with the new standard gear and accustomed to the cooperation with the Securitrons, giving Colonel Blackwell the freedom to withdraw the military from Vegas and focus on the surrounding area. With the Raiders moving ever closer to Vegas, Blackwell begins a campaign of aerial bombings on the Raider camps, forcing them away from Vegas. The Raiders begin moving back towards the towns, where they know the innocent civilians will prevent the military from bombing them. And they're right, Colonel Blackwell calls off the bombing runs when he hears of the Raiders' new strategy. The army is deployed to the towns, and over the next month, one by one, they clear the towns of raiders. And Mr. House then sends construction crews along with police support to ensure a stable recovery. As the army takes the north and moves the way down south, the raiders are driven southwest, and they soon lose their gang mentality in favor of strength in numbers with other raiders. Battle after battle, the raiders are massacred by the army. As the raiders are pushed further back, they are concentrated in ever increasing proportions. Ultimately, all of the remaining raiders are forced into the town of Prim, where they still number in the thousands, with more still managing to journey into the region. Mr. House wants them all gone, but Blackwell admits it will be a challenge to clear them all out while still saving the civilians. House and Blackwell then start planning the next move, with the army holding ground at Good Springs. As this stalemate progresses, the army reports sightings of hundreds of raiders entering the area from the west. They don't appear to be fighting the bandits already in Prim but it's unclear what's going on. Blackwell and House take this into account and prepare for a stronger attack. The following day, however, they receive reports of explosions coming from Prim. Blackwell authorizes reconnaissance flights. They report the town is under attack from the west. It's the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment. They're tearing through the raiders, torching and blasting everything in sight. The raiders are desperately trying to escape the town as the heavy armor cuts through them. Some have even resorted to pleading on their knees, but they're only given the mercy of a quick death. The gunfire ends within mere hours. Blackwell drives out to meet the 11th ACR. To Blackwell's surprise, they knew he was coming, and were aware of the scouts monitoring them. Blackwell commends them on their victory, but notes the dead civilians. A necessary loss, says the colonel in charge of the 11th. Blackwell immediately gets down to business. He asks how they survived and what their business is here. The 11th colonel explains that Fort Irwin and the two closest towns, Hopeville and Ashton, weren't hit by any nuclear weapons, and they were plagued with bandits migrating from the west coast cities. They eventually chased them out of California and followed them all the way to Prim. The 11th Colonel hands Blackwell a radio to talk to his superior. Blackwell takes the radio and is greeted by General Retzlaff. The General explains that he is the highest military officer left, and he wants to help Blackwell stabilize the area so they can rebuild. Blackwell explains the situation with Mr. House and the Securitrons, so the General requests an audience with Mr. House, and Blackwell obliges. Returning to Mr. House, Blackwell opens the channel with Retzlaff. As Mr. House outlines the situation that he has created, Retzlaff expresses concerns over Mr. House's seizure of power, but Blackwell defends his motives as honest and moral. Mr. House offers a treaty to General Retzlaff, that they should work together to rebuild, connecting the entire region to the same protection and supplies shared between House and Retzlaff. General Retzlaff is aware that he would likely be unable to win against House's Securitrons in combat, 
especially if Blackwell sided with the house. The house hasn't done anything unjust yet. So Retzlaff agrees to House's deal, and the Mojave Coalition is officially formed. The first step is establishing trade routes between all of the towns and cities in the region. The road's still intact, but the military sets up checkpoints along the trade routes to ensure that the transports aren't attacked. Although the raider groups were driven from the towns and cities, there still remains multiple groups of various installations around the area that the military does not yet have the capacity to deal with. The refugees and raiders entering the region have taken up most of their attention, as the amount of them has only increased with word spreading that Lower Nevada is a safe zone. One of the first matters to attend to is the connection of Hopeville and Ashton to Hoover Dam Supply. Although the power now has to be rationed throughout the entire region, there is power everywhere. As an act of goodwill and a way to ensure the protection of the region, the 11th ACR allows House to access their advanced military equipment so he can mass produce it in Vegas. The high level equipment is put into production in Vegas, but it can't come soon enough. The roaming marauders around the region have resorted to attacking the trade routes. By March, the new armaments are ready to be shipped out, with the police and military in rural areas and defending the trade routes receiving priority, stifling the marauder attacks on trade routes and giving enough flexibility to enable an attack on Helios 1, a bandit stronghold. Once they are cleared out, and the military has control of the facility, House sends a full crew to get the facility up and running. Helios 1 soon becomes operational and negates the need for power rationing. Aware of the continued inflow of refugees and raiders alike, House focuses on controlling the entry to the region. The plans are drawn up. The only long-term solution is determined to be a wall around the entire region. Scouting teams are sent out first to gather information on the exact boundaries of the radiation surrounding the area followed by eight construction crews that are sent out with military escorts to begin building the wall. Each two groups head towards one of the four closest cities, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Salt Lake City, and Phoenix. These are the sources of the greatest amount of refugees. The crews stop when they reach the 15 kilometer mark from the closest radiation. At each construction site, the two crews built outwards in opposite directions, leaving a gap at the starting point where a checkpoint and laser grid is set up. The 20 foot high walls are designed to funnel any refugees or bandits towards the checkpoints where the military can control who gets in. Meanwhile in Vegas, a food crisis is slowly approaching. House sees the population is increasing faster than the food production and begins seeking alternative methods to produce food. House convenes with Blackwell and Retzlaff about the matter. He suggests that Blackwell take some researchers to Vault 22 to either help the residents finish their work on plant growth or extract the data they had if something's wrong. Retzlaff also proposes an expedition to Big Mountain, a research center south of Hopeville. They may have something of use even if not relating to food production. So the two missions are initiated. Blackwell escorts a research team to Vault 22. With House's help contacting the vault to open, the team receives a warm welcome and although no useful developments have been made to plant growth yet, the extra hands should speed things along much faster. Meanwhile, the expedition team arrives at Big Mountain. They are greeted by swarms of bizarre hostile creatures. A voice over the intercom directs them into one of the buildings. There they are introduced to the remains of the inhabitants. The survivors explain that after the bombs hit, the test subjects broke loose and slaughtered most of the soldiers and scientists at the facility. Some are still trapped throughout it though, in the various different sections of the base. After hearing this, the expedition team contacts General Retzlaff. With this news, Retzlaff offers to rescue the personnel in the facility on the condition that they provide him with all the research contained within the entire facility, and also that they turn off those damned storms around Hopeville. The survivors have no choice but to agree and spread the message through to the other trapped survivors. The men are stretched thin already, but Retzlaff prepares a strike force to raid Big Mountain and extract all survivors and research. Upon arrival, the strike team starts clearing out the hostiles, although they prove to be more dangerous than originally thought. The soldiers make their way through the facility rescuing the survivors and their research, as well as any prototypes that are lying around, with only the occasional need for combat experience in acquiring them. Moving through the facility, one of the squads enters the X-22 Botanical Garden in hopes of retrieving the plant material. What they weren't expecting was to be ambushed by plants. After retrieving the first samples, they awake the sleeping horrors. Before anyone can tell what is happening, half the squad is dead to some sort of plant-human monster. The rest of the squad empties their rifles into the creatures, but not before the creatures attack them too, leaving the rest injured. After collecting all the samples and the corpses of their friends, they head back to the exfiltration point. After saving the researchers, salvaging the research, and deactivating Big Mountain's external experiments, the strike force withdraws from the facility. Upon relaying the reports of what lies at Big Mountain, 
Ratzlaff deems it necessary to go nuclear to prevent the spread of any of the creatures at Big Mountain. The green light is given and the launch is started. Within a few minutes, Big Mountain is nothing but ash. Ratzlaff decides it is time to reveal to House and Blackwell the existence of the missile silos under Hopeville and Ashton. But House admits he already knew, otherwise the missiles would have been shot out of the sky. It appears House doesn't really care about the silos. Back in Hopeville, the strike forces are returned with everything from Big Mountain. The research is processed and analysed with the help of personnel from Big Mountain. Much of it is determined to be impractical or unfeasible to use. There are a plethora of technologies with military applications though, and some that are incredibly useful. Namely the matter transformers that can produce anything from food to medical supplies, which would solve the projected food crisis. Retzlaff gives the designs to House to mass produce them. House admits he's surprised Retzlaff didn't attempt to use it as a leverage to gain power. Retzlaff would be lying if he said the thought didn't cross his mind, but by now he had enough faith in Mr. House. The design is modified by House to work on a much larger scale, and the machines are put into production. Over the next month, the matter transformers are set up around the cities and towns. With the expense of operating them, it is determined by Mr. House that the best course of action is to simply price items from the transformers at the industry average, which still happens to be in US dollars. With the food crisis prevented, Vegas and the rest of the coalition are stable for the foreseeable future, and the public's opinion of the situation is improving every day. But back in Hopeville, a new nightmare has begun. The soldiers that were attacked at the X-22 research facility at Big Mountain were unknowingly infected with a fungus that will slowly kill them. While their sickness was first presumed to be just the flu or possibly mild radiation exposure, the unknown infection spread like wildfire under the noses of everyone. With such a slow visible rate of infection, the cases weren't assumed to be from one source. Only now that the original soldiers infected, as well as others that were in close contact with them, have died has this fungus been determined as the cause. More alarmingly, the corpses that died from the infections came back to life seemingly controlled by the fungus, attacking everyone in sight. The creatures are put down, but not before they can infect more of the medical staff. With how long the fungus has to spread and the lethality of it pre and post mortem, General Ratzlaff puts Hopeville into emergency status, with immediate lockdown and quarantine of the town. Houses are loaded to the fungus and is recommended to take precautions in Vegas. But too late it seems, reports of similar illnesses to those in Hopeville are reported in the Vegas Strip. Not wanting to let the infection spread, House quarantines the entire Strip and puts his improvised design of the hazmat suits recovered at Big Mountain into production. Samples of the infection are sent to Vault 22 with hopes that they can formulate some sort of preventative measure against the fungus. Hopeville is devolving into chaos quickly. After many more die from the fungus and come back to life, killing more medical staff, the military begins executing those who are in the late stage of infection and burning their bodies. The townsfolk begin rioting, in response the police only use harsher tactics, and the rioting acts as a catalyst for the further spread of the infection. The situation isn't too dissimilar in Vegas either. The Strip has fallen to chaos, violent gangs have become the dominant authority in the Strip. Most of the police have withdrawn from the area, leaving only small numbers of Securitrons and CBRN units with upgraded hazmat suits to protect the Lucky 38 and eliminate any undead infected. Eventually, Vault 22 makes a breakthrough in their research and starts mass producing extremely potent fungicide that is almost completely harmless to humans. The fungicide is shipped out and the infection is brought under control, with all of the infected expected to fully recover in the coming weeks and the strip slowly being reclaimed by riot officers. In May 2078, the Coalition forces begin Operation Overwhelming Force. The 11th ACR begins spearheading assaults on raider camps in Coalition territory. Over the next two months, Coalition forces slowly clear out every camp, every office building, every bunker of raiders. The 11th cuts them all down. As this is happening, the wall continues to expand, now at an estimated 20% completion. The bandits attempting to enter the area are much easier to deal with. Now the work that took place at the various facilities out of Vegas can continue. Namely, House can finally return his employees to Repcon, allowing them to continue their work on aerospace technology. The Raiders are eventually all driven away by the 11th. After carefully searching, they are tracked to a resort hidden up in the mountains. The area is scouted, but no hostages are seen, so Blackwell orders the area be bombed. Afterwards, the infantry is sent to the area to eliminate any survivors. 
Anyone left in the crumbled ashes of the resort is swiftly executed, and the rest that manage to escape are hunted down. One of them is tracked to a small cave, with a hatch in it. Reinforcements are called and the soldiers proceed down through the hatch into the room below. It's an empty corridor with a door at the end. The lone raider clawing at the door is shot and the situation seems resolved. But the bunker sparks curiosity. This couldn't just be a homemade shelter, it's too advanced, too unsettling. The bunker's existence is relayed to Blackwell, who subsequently informs House and Retzlaff. House, being well aware of who this bunker belongs to, attempts to dissuade the others from looking into it any further. Retzlaff, also being well aware of what the bunker could hold, ignores House's warnings and orders the bunker be opened. Retzlaff is also aware of the danger of pursuing this lead, so he promotes Blackwell to Brigadier General. Even if it is just words at this point, the position will be filled if the worst were to happen to Retzlaff. Meanwhile, in the bunker, after hours of drilling through the locked door, it's finally opened to reveal a small hangar and yet another door. While the second door is being drilled through, the analysts sent to uncover the bunker's purpose determine that it is definitely a government bunker. After the second door is removed, the command center is discovered. All the data is analyzed, but there's very little mention of anything relating to the government. The files all seem to include references to something called the Enclave. It's uncertain what it is, but the communication lines are still operational. Well, only the one, directly to Control Station Enclave. Retzlaff is shocked by this news. He had heard rumors of a group called the Enclave, but never assumed they were true. He requests a channel be opened with this Control Station Enclave. Retzlaff is met with surprise by the person on the other end, not expecting any communication. Retzlaff gives his identification and asks for answers. The person on the other end simply replies that they are the government. Retzlaff asks for proof, and he's certainly provided it. The President of the United States subsequently greets him. Retzlaff is shocked beyond belief, but it must be true. Relieved the government is still intact, he asks what the plan to retake the country is. Because as Retzlaff explains, Vegas, a place free of radiation, wasn't destroyed by the bombs. It's a safe haven. The President is intrigued. He offers that he may send forces over there, but Mr. House needs to be removed and the city needs to be under enclave control. Retzlaff counters that there must be another option, a better way of retaking the country. The President merely scoffs at him. The goal was never to retake the country. It was to survive. The President repeats the terms for his help, then disconnects the call. Retzlaff is torn by this situation. He asks for the link to be traced. It turns out to be from an oil rig off the coast of California. So the leaders of the country just sat and watched everyone burn, huh? He decided to bury this information but his men refuse to forget it. The American government is still alive, and he was just going to choose House over America. Some of his men attempt to relieve him of duty, but others come to his defense. Retzlaff begs his men to forget the past and live in the present, but one of them attempts to shoot him. A firefight then ensues between the factions, with one fighting for the America of old, and the other following General Retzlaff. Retzlaff's loyalists eventually drive out the rebels and they retreat outside the bunker back to Hopeville. Retzlaff orders his men to follow them, and he radios House as well as the garrison at Hopeville to explain the situation. It's a race to see who can get back to Hopeville first. If the rebels manage to convince the rest of the garrison or the public to side with them, the entire region could be plunged into civil war. By the time Retzlaff arrives back at Hopeville, the city's already tearing itself apart. The rebels manage to convince much of the garrison and even some civilians to side with them. The loyalists come under heavy fire when they enter the town. Pinned down from all directions, the situation looks dire but the gunfire suddenly stops. It appears some of the men in Hopeville are still loyal to Retzlaff. General Retzlaff is taken to the missile silos where the rest of the Loyalists have set up. The Rebels are now deploying heavy armor. The Loyalists only manage to acquire a small amount of armor, so the Rebels start pushing through the city. With House's Securitron still miles out, Retzlaff resorts to calling Blackwell to bomb half the city. Knowing full well there would be many civilian casualties, Retzlaff watches as half the city lights up. The cost was great, but the Rebels are weak now. The Loyalists begin pressing the attack. However, the Rebels are still putting up a fight, so the Loyalists just focus on delaying them until reinforcements arrive. The Rebels sense this and start charging the unsuspecting Loyalists, but they are halted by the swarms of Securitrons that appear. Although the Securitrons request surrender, the reply comes in the form of bullets, and the Securitrons subsequently open fire along with the Loyalists, neutralizing the remainder of the Rebels. Retzlaff finally understands why House wanted that bunker buried so much. 
The mere presence of the old American government, the promise of returning to the ways of old, it was enough to almost destroy everything. But that wasn't the American government. America died when the bombs fell, those were just the people who killed it. General Retzlaff knew what he had to do. Retzlaff orders that the nukes be primed, he gives the coordinates and orders the launch. As he sits at his desk, he finds comfort in the fact that within a few minutes, control station Enclave will be reduced to cinders, but he knows he won't see it. Retzlaff pulls out a pen and paper, writing his apology for failing everyone. As the nuke touches down in the Californian Ocean, a single bullet is fired in a bunker in Hopeville. With Retzlaff's passing and Hopeville now being protected by Securitrons, the last remainder of the 11th Armoured Cavalry Regiment has no purpose anymore. The few that are left take their gear and as many supplies as they can carry and disappear into the desert to form a new legacy in the wasteland. Blackwell once again becomes the senior officer of the military, this time perhaps for real. The coalition remains, but House now holds the power. Finally, Vegas seems to be past its dark times. As the months go by, Hopeville is rebuilt and the wall continues to grow, with less raiders entering the area every day. All of the scientific work that was taking place before the war has now resumed, spent on by Mr. House. The quality of life becomes even greater than before the war, with the police force effectively stopping and preventing all crime and the constant development of new technologies for every sector. A radio beacon is finally set up announcing the safety of Vegas. By the end of 2078, stage 1 of the wall is completed, allowing all entry into Vegas to be controlled. Stage 2 begins in which the wall is increased in size and reinforced. House keeps the military but works with Blackwell to reform it into a refined and specialised defence force. With only two branches, the Army and the Air Force, any other military survivors are reassigned to either of those two branches. With the new military having superior training and brand new equipment, House begins the next projects, an improved rail system that connects all the towns and cities and something else. House is aware that Vegas is steadily growing and Lake Mead is slowly shrinking. He predicts a dangerous lack of water in the next 10 years. To counter this, House plans to build a pipeline from Vegas all the way to the ocean. The process will be slow and costly, but it's the only way to secure a sustainable water source for the years to come. The expedition teams are sent out first to map the path of the pipeline. After three months, the expedition teams return, signaling the beginning of the construction on the pipeline and the accompanying rail line. As the years slowly move on, people start to forget the old world, what happened to it, the old names. America, Nevada, they were just names, they mean nothing now. Most people could still tell you what they were, but they would prefer to leave the past where it belongs, the past. As such, the people that sought refuge in Vegas, the light and the darkness, a sanctuary, Eden, begin to call it so, Eden. The name catches on quick, it becomes the de facto name for the region. Not to any official capacity, but in people's minds, it is Eden. By 2082, the wall surrounding the city is complete, reinforced, 40 feet high and 20 feet thick. Eden itself is now a fortress. The pipeline is now at around 30% completion. Although with constant attacks on the construction and supply line of materials, it feels a lot more like a campaign than an agricultural project. Nevertheless, the soldiers trudge on. Back in Eden, the Repcon scientists, along with House, have made great progress in thruster efficiency and alternative fuel sources, as well as other useful developments relating to space exploration. Optimistic predictions place the possibility of having a fully functional moon base within 10 years. To speed along the process and secure future stability, House begins expanding the Repcon facility as well as Helios 1. He also starts directing the flow of refugees to the smaller towns to spread out the population, making it less crowded in the city. Eden continues to grow at an exponential rate. Its police force alone could overpower any present power in the wasteland. In 2085, Mr. House introduces the Mark III upgrade to the Securitrons and once again ramps out new police and military armor. With the pipeline now 70% complete, the project is on schedule. Although the army that set out on this project has changed so much, with new equipment and new faces all the time, by the end of the project, the army will have come out unrecognizable to its previous self. The expansion of Helios 1 and Repcon are now complete, allowing House to begin live testing on the rocket technology. The Vault 22 research into increased plant growth is also finally finished and used to increase crop growth, but kept regulated until the pipeline fixes the water limitation. By 2078 the pipeline is complete, but the work now begins on the new base to be built on the coast to ensure the water is pure before it's transported. 
In Eden, after numerous test flights, the Repcon facility is ready to launch a surveillance satellite into orbit. The launch goes off perfectly, and House now has eyes that can see the entire country. The following year, the water treatment plant along with a full outpost are completed at the end of the pipeline. The mass influx of water allows Eden to take its reliance off Lake Mead and finally make full use of Vault 22's research. Over the next year, a series of lakes and rivers are constructed and forests are planted all around the area, providing ease of access to water everywhere. The massive amount of water doesn't go unnoticed though. Back on the coast, the local bandits have started preparing to take over the water treatment plant. During the night, the combined bandits of the area attack the outpost. As the outpost is so new and in the middle of nowhere, the defenses are light. The attack comes unexpected and the base is slow to react. By the time the alarm is sounded, the bandits are already moving through the base. Outnumbered and caught off guard, the soldiers fall back while the bandits take hostages. The last soldiers hold the line at the station, calling for reinforcements. A full company is sent to the outpost, but by the time they reach it, it's almost dawn. Upon arrival, they find everyone at the station dead. It appears they failed to withstand the assault. However, all the bandits are dead too. There's no one in sight. Sweeping through the facility, they find everyone dead except for the workers. When questioned what happened, they explain that shortly after the soldiers at the outpost were overrun, another group infiltrated the outpost, slaughtering the bandits then disappearing back into the night. They all wore what looked like old army gear, bearing the crest of a black horse. Few of the soldiers remember what that symbol meant, but all of them understand they shouldn't look into the matter further. The whole situation is later swept under the rug by General Blackwell. The outpost is rebuilt with reinforced defenses and Mr. House uses it as the first live test site for his modified teleportation technology taken from Big Mountain. The technology is successful at long range transport to Eden, although it consumes a significant amount of power. Eden continues to move ever forward. By 2090, House begins developing an orbital laser based on the design taken from Helios 1. Within a year it's complete and House launches it into orbit. The development of rockets for human flights then begins. The following year, the first astronauts in decades are sent into orbit. The test is successful and the astronauts return to Earth. However, the pod touches down further off the coast than anticipated. The small fishing boats salvaged at the outpost aren't enough to reach that distance. House ends up having to locate a seaplane and have it flown out to retrieve the pilot, although not the capsule. After this event and with what occurred at the outpost, House sees that an upgraded Air Force and small navy could be useful. Construction of a new aerospace facility is hastily begun and all launches are put on hold. Within a year, the facility is producing new planes and rockets, allowing House to begin the second part of his acquisition. Using his satellite, he located some remaining navy ships still docked at the remains of Pearl Harbor Navy Base in Hawaii. So the operation begins, four platoons are sent on planes to the base. Upon landing, the area is completely quiet. The soldiers exit the planes wearing full NBC gear. The radiation in the area is likely to be high. As the platoons reach the dock, each ship left is explored, and after dealing with many feral ghouls the systems are analysed. Only three ships are in good enough condition to leave the dock, an aircraft carrier, a destroyer and a corvette. The soldiers begin starting the ships, but the process could take hours. Within an hour, the soldiers spot people watching them. Shooting at them to scare them off seems to work, however only half an hour later a large group of bandits appear, revealing themselves by taking shots at the soldiers. The planes waiting outside of the radiation are immediately contacted to provide close air support. This scatters the bandits, forcing them into buildings. However, this turns out to be worse as the bandits are hiding in cover and have much better vantage points to take shots at the ships. Two squads are sent to take them out in close quarters. The soldiers storm the buildings, easily outmatching the opponents in close range. As more and more of the bandits are taken down, the soldiers notice how most of them are thin and can't use guns very well. Finally, the sergeant decides to take off one of the dead bandit's gas masks. The boy underneath didn't look any older than 17, and he was almost all skin and bone. The sergeant suggests they take a different approach to dealing with the bandits. As most of them have barricaded themselves in one room, the soldiers start attempting to communicate with the bandits inside. At first they're hostile towards the soldiers, but the promise of food eventually draws them out. After the soldiers demonstrate they're no longer a threat, what looks to be the leader of the bandits, a young woman in her early 20s, steps forward and explains the situation. They were survivors from the war that had survived out in the wilderness for the past few years. Over time the radiation killed all of the food sources, from fish to plants, and sometimes they became food sources to the mutated ones. The men of the group slowly got withered down, now it was mostly women and children. 
In the last few years, they had ventured around so much with little food. They recently decided to return to the city, hoping to scavenge leftover materials from before the war. Then around a month into the scavenging with little success, they heard the planes landing and started scouting the soldiers. Thorman explains that they thought the soldiers were bandits because they were shooting at them. Though bandits or not, the soldiers were well equipped, so they thought the soldiers were sure to have plenty of food. The sergeant tells them about Eden, about its safety, and offers to take them there. The survivors are obviously skeptical, but they don't exactly have any other option. The young woman accepts and explains she'll need to tell the rest of the group back at their camp. The sergeant radios the colonel in charge of the operation and explains the situation. After receiving their new orders, the soldiers and survivors split up into two groups. Most of the survivors head to the ships. The strongest survivors head towards their camp along with one of the squads. As they're heading towards the camp, it becomes clear that all the firefighting woke up the dead city. Monsters, mutants, and everything in between seem to now be aware of their location. The continued gunfire at these beasts only seemed to alert more to their position. The walk to the camp turns into a run, and then into a sprint. Every time they look back, there appears to be more things chasing them. Eventually, they manage to lose the creatures with smoke grenades and reach the camp. The survivors are slow to get moving, and even when moving, not that fast. Some of the creatures roaming around aimlessly run into the survivors again, and the soldiers have no choice but to fire at the creatures, ringing the dinner bell for the rest in the area. As the survivors are rushing to the ships, swarms start flooding the streets. Gunfire does little to stem the tide, but does work when these things take a swipe at any of the survivors. The adrenaline becomes a great motivator for everyone to hurry up, although those who are too slow get devoured by the Horde. Once the group is in clear view of the ships, the crews open fire on the Horde. The Corvette and the Destroyer leave the dock while the carrier waits. As the survivors desperately board the carrier, the mutants are snapping behind them. As soon as the last person boards the ship, the carrier exits the dock and sails off of the other ships, leaving Pearl Harbor in the distance. The planes eventually land on the carrier, and although the food brought for the journey gets stretched thin, the new crew and the survivors make it back with the ships in usable condition. Upon return, the survivors are brought to Eden where they are taken in. With the new ships at the disposal of Mr. House, he reintroduces the Navy, building the initial structure with Navy veterans. The rocket launches are resumed and testing continues. Only a year later, in 2093, House is almost ready to establish a moon base. The research is completed, now all that's left is to build the rocket. After a few short months, the rocket is primed and is launched from the Repcon test site. The rocket has a smooth journey, taking off from Earth and landing on the moon without any incidents. The first moon base, Luna 1, is set up as a research facility with the potential for terraforming the Earth. Over the next two years, the moon base is expanded, increasing the size of all of the facilities and adding a sensor array as well as nuclear silos. House is preparing for all possibilities. So fast forward 10 years to 2105. Vegas and the surrounding area are now hold a population of over 8 million. The outpost is a major naval base and has developed its own town next to it. Crime and disease have been almost eradicated, and living standards are the highest in all of history. The moon base is a fully functional colony with a self-sufficient ecosystem, and back on Earth, Mr. House is preparing to launch rockets to Mars. Although those plans are about to get interrupted, Luna 1 is in the process of upgrading their sensors. Upon completion, they scan something extraordinarily large. Two of the new Icarus model space fighters are sent to investigate, although they can't locate anything. Then they suddenly disappear. A larger squad of fighters is sent to investigate, yet they find nothing. Tracing the large object on the scanners, they begin firing at the empty space in case something is somehow appearing invisible. And they're right, a massive ship appears in front of them, blocking the attacks with its energy shield. The ship starts firing at them and they begin firing back, but the shield seems to take all the damage they can put out. Eventually Mr. House contacts Luna 1, ordering them to withdraw the fighters and launch the missiles, then to also prepare an incursion team. House distracts the hostile ship with his orbital laser. As the guns focus on the satellite, the nuclear missiles detonate on the shield, and the resulting blasts disable the electronics of the ship, knocking out the shield. The boarding teams reach the ship a few minutes later. Storming it, they are shocked to find that the crew is what looks to be extraterrestrial. Nevertheless, they return gunfire at the aliens and carve their way through the ship, exterminating all of the aliens. Before long, the ship is under the control of the incursion teams. Reinforcements come later to help with the cleanup operation. All of the remaining aliens are slowly cleared out and captured. The vast number of human prisoners are found and each one of them is safely removed from stasis. The disgusting abominations are also found. 
The best course of action is determined to be swift execution and all of the abominations are put out of their misery. Researchers eventually figure out how to control the ship and bring it down to land on the Repcon test site. The ship is carefully analysed and the alien technology is used to develop more advanced human tech. And so, as the ships leave for Mars, Mr. House stays on Earth, getting to work on his new project, now with the help of the alien technology acquired from the mothership. Although it only started with one city, House proved that he could save the human race and push them forward to the stars. With the acquirement of the alien technology, House was able to accelerate technological advancement by years, maybe even decades. Within only 10 years, the colony's ships were ready, ready to travel to other galaxies and expand humanity's existence beyond comprehension. With the launch of the colony ships into the far reaches of space, General Blackwell felt it was time and retired. A few months later, he passed away peacefully in his sleep. Mr. House, having completed everything he had planned and seeing the passing of the one man he considered his friend, although he would never admit it, he decided it was time for him to take a back seat for a while, see how humanity manages without his direct interference. And the truth is, humanity prospers. House gave them the key and they continue to grow, with imagination being the limit. The same can't be said for the rest of humanity outside of what House built. But eventually, a dominant power emerges in the wastes. A group of highly skilled individuals that bear the mark of the Black Horse, a group that calls themselves the Desert Rangers. They eventually bring order to the wasteland, and everything appears as though it will turn out alright in the end. Humanity's future, whether inside the walls of Eden or not, looks bright. <laughs>